Okay, my name is Tom Bradley. I'm, uh, I'm actually at Colorado State University in Fort Collins, and I'm here to present about V to G. So V to G is this concept where, um, you know, what we, where uh, electric vehicles are gonna be connected to the grid, and plug-in electric vehicles have um, energy storage on board them. So the idea is that basically, we could perhaps use that energy storage to perform grid services of some kind. Uh, the idea is that uh, obviously, you know, as the electric vehicle sort of, as the uh, market share of electric vehicle goes up, then uh, the amount of energy storage that we might have on the electric grid would be very high. It, it, the, the, you know, the problem will be that it's sort of associated with these vehicles that are mobile or that have other uses associated with them or things like that. And so um, there'll be some particular challenges associated with that. So what I'm gonna talk about in terms of V to G is basically the idea that we could actually not just charge electric vehicles by taking electricity off the grid and putting it onto the vehicle, but V to G sort of incorporates the idea that we could also have two-way electricity exchange, two-way energy exchange, and be able to actually um, sort of source power to the electric grid from vehicles. So just as sort of introduction, right, um, in general, uh, plug-in vehicles are of a variety of types. Uh, we can talk about electric vehicles being plug-in vehicles. We can talk about plug-in hybrid electric vehicles being plug-in vehicles. Uh, there's, uh, you know, obviously a suite of technologies, whether it's uh, plug-in fuel cell vehicles or electric buses, and these are all at different sizes and scales. But if we talk about um, light-duty transportation, then in general, vehicle charging is done somewhere between about four kilowatts in sort of low-level level two charging and maybe 120 kilowatts in sort of supercharger, DC fast charging uh, constructs. And the batteries are, uh, per vehicle, are on the order of uh, maybe eight kilowatt hours or four kilowatt hours maybe for a plug-in Prius type vehicle, a very low range plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, and something up to 90 kilowatt hours for a Model X. So again, it's sort of, you know, this, we're gonna talk about it again and again, but the part of the challenge here is the the sort of diversity of uh, structures, the diversity of types of um, energy storage and vehicles and all this kind of stuff that we're going to have to interface with. So um, when we talk about the, uh, the sort of uh, 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 scaling the problem, thinking about the role that V2G can have on the electric grid, I'm going to try to have a couple of figures that I can give you guys. I'm very, I hope everybody took a picture because I'm going to replace this beautiful graph with probably chicken scratches here, but I'll Everybody, yeah, I saw, <laughs> so Kate right? took it, exactly. Thank goodness, thank goodness. <laughs> um, right, okay, so uh, well, the reference that I was sort of using, I think, as uh, to understand what's going on, um, for example, is the, is the NREL Renewable Futures, uh, Renewable Energy Futures Study. And in those cases, for example, if we talk about the amount of storage on the grid in, you know, in 2010 in the U.S., we were talking about the, a storage of, uh, of 20 gigawatts. And uh, in their most sort of, you know, storage intense future studies that were uh, in 2050, this goes up to about uh, 150 gigawatts of energy storage, stationary energy storage, right? Um, so in comparison to this, perhaps, the, pl the load that is associated with plug-in electric vehicles is on the order of 356 terawatt hours per year. Um, so, and that's under the assumption that about 40% of the vehicle stock for the United States is plug-in electric vehicles. In general, they were studying plug-ins that were 20 mile range-ish. So maybe that eight, sort of eight kilowatt hour uh, battery energy range. And um, so that's about 150 million uh, plug-in electric vehicles in 2050, right? So, um, you know, it's easy, easy to see perhaps, and we'll, I'll talk about some more, that this, the scale of the amount of energy storage that we have in, uh, in the vehicles could be quite high. If we have, a, for example, if we talk about 150 million plug-in vehicles at maybe eight kilowatt hours per vehicle, like a plug-in hybrid that has about 20 miles of range perhaps in 2050, then that would be 1.2, so, I say here again in the 2050 PEV sort of energy storage might be on the order of 100, uh, yeah, 1.2 terawatt hours of storage in vehicles. So again, you know, think about it in the context of uh, we were talking about Tesla uh, Gigafactory or something like that, right? So that's 50, 
gigawatt hours of, of, of batteries coming out of that factory each year is their sort of long-term goal, 2020 goals. Um, so, okay, so this, you know, so on some level, uh, you know, one might say, well, that's really, ex this, this could be really exciting, right? We have a lot of energy storage that's available on, in vehicles. It's, how do, you know, how do we make that connection? How do we take advantage of that? How, what's, the, what's the ways that we can actually uh, realize value out of that? And so now for me, um, you know, what I'm, uh, uh, this sort of the, you know, I think this is the big picture. People have seen this for a while. And um, uh, there's been, a, there, there's some, er, you know, early proposals from folks about how to realize value out of plug-in electric vehicles uh, and doing V to G sort of things. And in general, those kind of focused, I would say, on, on um, what are the benefits that consumers could realize out of having this plug-in electric vehicle, right? So the sort of the way that people thought about this originally was that, okay, if I'm a consumer and I'm gonna go out and buy a, a, a electric vehicle and it's gonna be more expensive than a conventional vehicle, how do I realize some extra value out of being able to provide grid services out of that uh, battery pack? And so they're, you know, really, you know, esteemed folks, uh, uh, Will Kempton and, and um, you know, there were people at EPRI that we worked with and stuff like that, that were they were trying to figure out how to make this happen and what kind of value we could actually realize out of that. Um, so the sort of near term concept for V to G was that uh, we could provide basically sort of uh, ancillary services, especially frequency regulation services to the grid. So I don't know if everybody's sort of familiar with those ideas. I'm sure most people probably are. But the idea is that in that case, uh, you know, in order to balance the frequency, the amount of energy that's on the grid, um, there's a signal that goes back to the um, to ancillary services providers that actually will allow those um, ancillary service providers to provide electricity back to the grid or to be able to sort of put electricity to and from the grid. It'll allow for area control error control, right? And the idea is that uh, V to G could actually provide that because there's some benefits that, that are sort of hypothetically associated with that um, frequency regulation signal that, that first of all, it's relatively low energy and in the utility world, um, relatively low energy doesn't always agree with what the vehicle world low energy is, right? So for example, um, the uh, area control error for California ISO basically is on the order of, um, I've got the number, seven gigawatt hours over a week, right? So it, they, they, there's sort of this mismatch. We think of about an area control error signal as being net zero energy over time. It turns out that's not actually true. It in fact has lots and lots of energy uh, gigawatt hours of energy over uh, the course of a week. Uh, PJM and others have, in, have come up with low energy frequency regulation signals that might be particularly amenable to uh, V to G, but even those are on the order of megawatt hours over a week of discharge and charge. So the, the frequency regulation market is not really set up very well to be able to actually actuate the eight kilowatt hours, order of magnitude, you know, three orders of magnitude smaller than um, that are in a battery pack than utility scale sort of uh, signals. The other part of it that's a little bit tricky is that uh, vehicles uh, have a, you know, when you think about frequency regulation, you think about ancillary services, these are supposed to be high reliability services to the utilities. So utilities go into these um, markets and they ask for 99% uh, availability, for example, 99% um, uh, reliability. And vehicles in general are, have sort of these multi-uses, of course. We, if you actually have plugging in your car, you'd like to be able to use it as a transportation service as well. So um, logically, right? So the idea is actually, if, you know, so if you, if you sort of plot out the way that people actually use vehicles in a day, and I'll, you know, if this is sort of like 100% of vehicles are plugged in at home, uh, this actually happens in general sort of at, at nighttime, you know, 99.9% .9 of vehicles are, are available at home if they're, if they're um, you know, light duty vehicles again. And then in the daytime, this goes down to about 65% of vehicles or so are available at home. And uh, the, the, so the challenge is that, uh, especially during these, um, you know, sort of shoulders here, what's happening is that people are coming up to their car in the garage, maybe that the, hypothetically that car is engaged in contracting to be able to provide frequency regulation to the utility, but then people say, well, I gotta go to Safeway. Uh, I'm gonna pull the plug and drive away and that's 
you know, that's a contract violation from the utility's point of view. And in general, these are done, um, you know, with, uh, it's getting smaller and smaller, but these are based, you know, these are done, uh, I believe in California, in one hour increments. So there's, there's a lot of uh, dynamics that happen in transportation world that happen at a smaller than one hour increment. The other thing then that's, uh, that's tricky is the, um, you know, I sort of talked about uh, of the availability, talked about the state of charge um, problems, and just to, to sort of put that in some context, you know, I, I, I sort of came to this problem as a little bit of maybe a V to G pessimist, perhaps. I sort of said, well, okay, well, let's see if we can figure out what the real valuation of V to G would be in this frequency regulation markets. And um, if, if we combine these things like the, that they're not very available, okay, well, that's all right. We could actually do things like aggregate them. We could actually put them in a big pool, and then you could take something that's 65% reliable, and if you have three of them, it turns out they're 99% reliable again, right? So you can do that. The problem is then you're splitting your money among your three best friends instead of keeping it all to yourself. Sort of uh, um, the state of charge limitations, reliability requirements, using true, uh, the, the real s uh, actuator signals, all this kind of stuff, sort of cut down the amount of money that people make to be something that, um, you know, in the calculations that we've done, uh, is it, something that's on the order of about $2,000 of value realizable out of your vehicle to do V to G over 10 years, over its 10 year life, perhaps, right? So you might say, oh, 2,000 bucks, I'd take a $2,000 check, right? I mean, that's fine. Just, you know, again, in context, the, the, if you have a $60,000 Tesla or something, the IRS depreciation of it is uh, 30 cents a day or 50 cents a day or whatever, right? So, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it, the, uh, yeah, so $2,000 over 10 years is about 50 cents a day in V to G benefits, and then your depreciation is like $30 a day, I apologize, right? So, it's, you know, one could debate whether or not that's actually really a great value. So to me, at least, one of the things is, you know, one of the, one of the big uh, takeaways is that V to G, I, in my opinion, and I think we have studies to back it up, is not a great application in terms of its near term and, and, uh, and its, its ability to service these, these utility markets that are maybe high value um, ancillary services markets. But um, that doesn't really speak, you know, I think what, what, what was exciting about this invitation to come up and talk about this is that it doesn't really speak to what has to happen to that last 20%, right? And does it have value in, a, in order to be able to actually, um, in order to be able to, uh, you know, serve the purposes that energy storage has in um, this concept of being able to get to 100%, um, you know, 100% renewable energy stuff. And the, so the idea is that, um, the, the, so let me just speak to that then instead of I think what, what I, you know, perhaps we understand our near term stuff to be. Um, so again, like when we talk about what the purpose of uh, storage was in these studies that uh, NREL and other have done, uh, it's not actually very amenable to what V to G is perhaps good to do because V to G again is a low energy, perhaps high power storage. We have the ability to put 120 kilowatts out of a particular vehicle if we needed to do that, but we can only do that for, um, you know, for an hour at a time or something like that in order before the battery is depleted. So th you can think about V to G strengths perhaps, and it's the same as battery strengths as being um, a power over an energy uh, sort of product. Now the studies that people have done, and I think when we look at what the, the uh, purpose of energy storage was, for example, in these NREL studies, it was things like avoid its load shifting, its storing of curtailments in multi-hour periods, um, it's things like reserves, uh, and that's more of an energy play or whatever, right? I mean, I hope I'm characterizing that right. And I think the idea there is, uh, but some of that actually comes out of the fact, of course, that, that those are not second by second by second studies or something, right? So. Uh, we don't really have good evidence for whatever the role, for the role that V to G could play, say, in a 100% um, renewable scenario. So just to sort of put it out there then, I think that, um, for example, just to do a quick calculation, if we talked about our 100% renewable scenarios and we talked about the things where, you know, we're measuring now in units of gigawatt days to be able to get real energy storage value out of this, um, V to G does have the kind of ability to scale at that level. For example, if you talked about um, one gigawatt and you divide it by, uh, you know, 10 million vehicles or something like that in California, that would be, that's 100 watts per vehicle. 
Uh, so a little increment of charging rate change, a little increment of, of you know, perhaps if the vehicle has to discharge back to the grid, all that kind of stuff, can, be, uh, can actually have large value when it's aggregated across the entire state or in huge, in huge groups. So, um, so at least the, the sort of, I'd say, conceptually right, that the V to G can provide some, can contribute to this energy storage problem and the energy storage solution that we're talking about in the 100% renewable scenarios. Now, to think about what the technical challenges of V to G are, um, so technically I'd sort of propose, uh, you know, we have done demos at Colorado State University and, um, you know, industry and RMI and, um, and uh, University of Delaware and all sorts of folks have done these demonstration scale projects where the DC-DC converters and the connections and the chargers and the, and, and the batteries and all this kind of stuff is technically capable of doing this. I don't think that there's that, that too many, uh, let's say, you know, sort of physical power electronics challenges. When I think about what the challenges are, um, they're really more the control of these distributed, autonomous, and multi-stakeholder systems, right? So if you think about, you know, just uh, to me, the essence of V to G is that it's this energy, it, it's the thing we were talking about yesterday, the essence of V to G is that it's a, uh, it's a system that we need to be uh, considering as, um, yeah, that, the, that it's sort of has this alternative use, right? It has, it's, it's multi, uh, multi-objective. So when I think about, for example, the pool pump example where, that we were talking about, you know, maybe in that case, the requirements that kind of come from the customer, you know, I'll put sort of customer as a stakeholder, might be relatively simple. We sort of said in 48 hours, we got to get this pool circulated. And so this can participate in energy markets. This can participate in uh, demand response markets or whatever. And um, you know, if this is again a pool pump, this might be relatively easy to be able to think about. When we talk about, uh, you know, for example, the building energy systems, you know, I, I work in a brand new low, you know, lead platinum building and all this kind of stuff. There's a giant energy management system that does all this kind of thing. And when I arrive at, you know, when I arrive at work, sometimes the lights are on, sometimes the lights are off. Sometimes the heat is on, sometimes the heat is on. Sometimes it turns it off on me while I'm typing, sometimes it doesn't or whatever. And this is just part of the modern world, right? Is that we, I, you know, I have to work within this autonomous, multi-stakeholder, multi-optimized uh, problem. And sometimes that inconveniences me 1%, right? And in this case, we're gonna say the same thing about V to G, right? Is that it's gonna have to, you're gonna have this vehicle now and it's gonna have to work within, you know, my, my sort of utility as a stakeholder um, is gonna participate in energy markets and demand response and frequency regulation and, and uh, you know, real time markets and ramp rate markets and, uh, you know, disaster when all the clouds come over California markets or whatever else. And I'm also gonna have to meet another 10 requirements from the customer, which is it, it has to, be my Saturday car, it has to be my sports car, it has to be my grocery getter, it has to also you know, manage my home energy management system and all these kind of things like that, right? So to me, I think the big questions are how do we actually, how do we, how do we uh, manage that data? How do we control those things? I, how do we capture consumer intent, right? How do we know when people are willing to, to arrive at their vehicle and have it be at 60% state of charge? That's okay sometimes, sometimes that's not okay. Am I out? Okay. So just to, you know, I think when I think about other technical problems, I mean, I would say uh, we talked about it the other day. Uh, how do we construct markets or actuation signals or performance me metrics or micropayments or all these kind of things that actually allow people to do this in 100 million vehicles? I, we talked, um, our uh, colleagues talked about things like treating reliability as now a stochastic quantity. So it's not something that uh, we just can... Um, you know, that, that reliability is something that just happens when a part breaks in a generator. This is something that we're, we're gonna have a, re, a reliability to every single, to every, uh, to every lever that the utility will pull. And it'll actually, you know, the, that, that reliability will show up in, in different ways than it has in the structures and, and machines that we use right now. And uh, I, you know, would just propose again that things like the pricing and markets just has to be more responsive to the actual value that the balancing authority or utilities actually gets out of the, um, 
out of uh, the service. So again, time of use, in my opinion, time of use rates, even day ahead markets are not going to be enough to actually incent and, and realize value out of V to G. We're going to have to do, uh, you know, f f we've done studies that show that, that uh, doing things like five minute markets and all this kind of stuff is really the only way to do it. So to me, at least, I, I was excited to be a to be able to talk about this because I think, again, it can challenge some of the ways that we've sort of constructed our work over the past years uh, to think about what the real, you know, maybe it's longer term, maybe it's a little bit more barriers are out of the way, maybe it's that, uh, um, yeah, but, but I think that there could be some value for V2G in these long term, renew large renewable scenarios. So, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Yeah.